All right, the recording is now up and running, and we'll go ahead and get started. It's uh, good to have you guys here. I see I got Jacob, and Caitlin, Rebecca, Tim, uh, Paul, and a few other folks with us. Thank you um, for being here. We got one last class session, and the semester uh, officially ends tomorrow, although you guys do end up the, uh, the remaining assignments will be open for a few more days after that. So um, anyways, man, I can't believe it's been a, it's been a, been a long semester. It's been a, a long uh, school year. You know, it's been now over a year since I, as an automotive teacher, had to transition to online, uh, online teaching. And uh, it's really, it's, it's kind of hard for me to believe that really. Um, I feel very fortunate to be able to try to teach somebody something in this format, but um, I certainly miss being with you guys, being working in the shop, uh, sharing stories in the classroom and that type of thing. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to kind of getting back to some normalcy in, in what we do here uh, with our summer classes. Um, as you guys can see, if you're following the news, our, our regulations and stuff are are changing day by day. And so it sounds like uh, we might have some modifications this summer, but uh, you know, probably by next spring, we'll be getting more to a, a really a normal, normal schedule. Um, so that's, that's super exciting. Um, we've been able to cover just a ton of information though online, much more so than I thought we would ever uh, be able to do. And so that is, is fantastic. In fact, I'm gonna just go up and open up our uh, one of our last announcements. I have a few more for you that I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll post before we're all done. But um, uh, the thing I wanted to bring out tonight is that the, the automotive industry really is hungry for you guys to enter the industry. Um, I have a meeting with AAA next week uh, about starting an apprenticeship program. I mean, you guys who are learning automotive technology, who are willing to go into the automotive industry, whether it's to be a technician and, you know, work on stuff with tools or diagnose things, um, you are wanted, whether you, you know, we're looking for people to help uh, the parts side. We're looking for people to help uh, in service advising. I mean, just transportation overall is huge there's so many facets to it and i want you guys to know that you are in demand and as such one of the things you might be interested in is applying for this scholarship it's put on by the california new car dealers association um five thousand dollar award uh and there's uh 20 uh regional winners so within Within our region of Northern California, there's going to be 20 winners. Um, so, you know, the, that uh, form here is loaded on Canvas. I'd love for you guys to go there and apply. Don't worry. Like, I, I know some of you might be hesitant because you might be thinking, look, I haven't even had a hands-on automotive class. Don't worry about it. You, you know, if you've gone through this whole semester and you still want to get involved in cars, you have the passion and the enthusiasm definitely to do it. And I encourage you guys to apply for this thing, okay? Um, so I have that in our, uh, one of our final class announcements is about um, that scholarship. I really would like you guys to apply. Now, you guys know that I am definitely uh, a motorhead here. And if I just fast forward this thing a little bit, you can see that, uh, you know, I definitely have a passion for, um, for racing and uh, whether it's autocross, goat carts, road racing, I mean, it, it's just, it's just a lot of fun to get out on, on the track and, and push your car at speed. And there's all kinds of ways for you to do that or just be part of the action. Um, you know, we don't always, we think about the stuff that's going on on track. However, there is a lot of people that work behind the scenes to, uh, to make this happen. 
every single race event has a group of people that put it on and make it happen from friends and family who are, you know, in the pits, like we just saw right there, um, to, uh, to the racers that are out there to, let's see if I can find some uh, corner workers out here. I'm sure we have some in this video. Uh, there we go. You can see them kind of in the background there. Um, anyways, it, it takes a lot of, it, it takes a village, if you will, to put on a race event. It takes a lot of people. And so in this announcement, I have that little promo video from the Sports Car Club of America. Um, but I also have this tech day registration. I have been working with the SCCA because um, I love racing, but it's expensive. You know, it's hard to get out there and it's hard to get into it if you don't know somebody that's into it. Well, guess what? You guys know somebody that's into it because I'm into it. So um, I've been working with them to set up this uh, tech day. And this tech day is um, all about letting you guys know, if I can get back to it there, letting you guys know about uh, SCCA racing and how you can get involved, um, how you can, um, uh, you know, help work at an event. And we have it set up so that if your goal is to get on on the racetrack, but you're like, oh, that's that's a lot of money. I don't have money to get on the racetrack. Well, guess what? You can work the race events to help pay for you to then later on do the racing yourself. And so that's what this this event here um, is all about. There's the better flyer. I was trying to get that flyer up there. So, uh, you know, whether you're working as part of our emergency crew or in timing and scoring, which is, is what I do or flagging, um, I think a lot of you guys would really like the tech side. Um, and so that way you can catch people if they're, if they're cheating or, or not. I mean, that's really, really interesting. Um, it's, it's really a, a great way to get started in the sport and meet people and stuff. So, uh, that's coming up in June. Now the website I'm on is called motorsport registration. And uh, if you want to know what motorsport events are going on in our area, I would go to this motorsport registration site, click this thing, find nearby events, <clears throat> and you'll see um, all kinds of stuff going on. Now, I had typed in um, uh, SCCA here, but there, there's just all kinds of stuff in our area. Uh, fun ways to, to, to have fun with your car, if you will. Um, and uh, so, so you can get signed up with this website. They'll send you emails about what's going on in your area and uh, what you can take part in. Uh, whether it's a track day where you get to take your personal race car out on the track, like uh, with my friends here at Hooked on Driving, um, or it's a wheel-to-wheel -wheel race or an autocross event, um, there's just all kinds of different stuff to do. Now, some of these are, you know, uh, way far away from us, but, uh, you know, you, you can dial us into, to our area to see what's, to see what's close An autocross, you take your street car and they set up a course with cones and it's how fast can you go through the cones? If you hit a cone, it adds a second to your time. So it's a great way to get started in racing. And as you can see, it's not, uh, not super expensive. This one, uh, they must give you a lot more track time. It is, that one is a little bit more expensive. They're usually about $40 or so. Um, so in our announcement, I give you some links of stuff to do if you're involved, want to get involved in racing and of course scholarships. And I'm just, uh, you know, I wanted to thank you guys for being with me and, and um, uh, you know, participating in this online learning. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting those remaining assignments um, I'll be um, working on grades throughout the weekend. And by about Monday of next week, I should have those final grades done. So if you get on Canvas by like next Monday or Tuesday and go to grades, uh, you should see your final grade in the class. Now, this is my test student right here. And you can see my test student isn't doing real good. 
but I am very happy to report that my test student is the only one with an F in our class. By and large, you guys are doing fantastic, and that makes me super happy uh, to, to see that. So I have one last uh, presentation for you, and actually, we're going to finish up last week's presentation is what we're working on tonight. So to do that, I'm going to change the screen share, and we're going to open up that presentation. All right. And... We were about halfway through. We'll get that thing opened and we'll clean up that screen share. Okay, here we go. Now we were talking about how cars can have lots of different problems, right? We can have a car that's a no start and there's something different between a no start that cranks over and one that doesn't crank over. We were also talking about how cars can uh they maybe they they start up and run but they're running rough or you have a lack of power overheating is a real big problem as well especially as we head into these summer months um you could have a car fail smog and of course there's the infamous check engine light or we call it in our industry we actually call it the mill for a malfunction indicator lamp um so what are some just basic tips for diagnosing some of these, um, some of these problems? Well, let's, uh, let's get into some of this stuff. Remember that you gotta have spark, fuel, compression, and all that in the proper order to run. We talked about that. And then uh, last week we talked about, hey, don't forget to check your battery. And that kind of led us into uh, a discussion about electrical measurement. Now what I need to do actually here is I need to um, Oh no, I'm in the right spot. I was gonna say, I, I think I need to fast forward this, but no, no, I got it queued up here. Um, so that led us into a discussion about electrical measurement. And with that discussion on electrical measurement, we talked about voltage. Voltage is electrical pressure. It'd be like pressure in your water hose. So if I have a water tower here and I'm putting some pressure on there, that's going to make water pressure. Well, that's our electrical pressure, uh, usually supplied from a battery. Um, that's the pressure in our system. Now, current in an electrical circuit is the flow of electrons, kind of like water flowing through this hose. And of course, there's always some resistance or opposition to that flow of electrons, which would be like having a kink in that hose. And an electrical circuit, for the most part, works exactly like a water circuit pictured here. Okay, So it's voltage, current, and resistance. Um, contrary to popular belief, there is no juice in here. It's all about electrons and the flow of electrons, uh, voltage, current, and resistance. Uh, and so that's where it's all about. And that's what you need your electrical multimeter or DMM here to measure this stuff. Because what's tough with electricity is you can't see it, but you can measure it and you can certainly see the effects of it in your circuit, right? And of course, if you got your hands on a high enough amount of a voltage, you definitely would feel it because it would shock you, right? So um, usually somewhere around that's supposed to be a three. Let's see if I can fix that. 30 volts is now where we're getting into a dangerous voltage level where it could really hurt you and do some damage. So the nice thing about that then is that for um, automotive circuits, the majority of our circuits use a 12 volt battery. A little bit bigger than this one that I have here, but again, they're a 12 volt battery. So what that means is 12 volts is not enough voltage to uh, shock you by itself. It's not enough electrical pressure. However, if you were wearing a metal wristwatch or a wedding ring, or, or I guess any type of ring really, that could conduct electricity and then that could you know, burn you really bad. And so that's why when we're doing automotive work. As we went through safety, we talked about taking off any, any jewelry, uh, things like that, because it, though, that becomes a great conductor of electricity and that can definitely hurt us. 
even on a 12 volt electrical system like you'd have in a car. Um, one other thing related to electrical testing, these days we don't just have regular cars anymore, right? We have hybrid vehicles, we have electric vehicles. So now we are getting voltages that are definitely lethal on these hybrids and EVs. And so if you are going to work on a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle, you really wanna do some high voltage HV safety training. So you know how to deal with those systems. There's a lot of maintenance things that you can do on a car like a Prius that don't have anything to do with the high voltage systems. But I always think it's smart to have some high voltage training under your belt before you start working on those cars, just so you know what you can touch and you can't. We, we do kind of joke around in class sometimes we say, hey, just don't lick the orange wires, but there really is more to it than that. So um, at AR, we, we feature uh, those types of classes. In fact, we'll be running our 309 hybrid class in the fall, which is a hands-on working on a hybrid class where you're gonna get all that high voltage training. So anyways, if you, if you do wanna work on vehicles like that, uh, I definitely encourage it. We know that that is the wave of the future and we are, we're even seeing that in racing. You know, I set up racing classes for electric spec racer Fords this year. And we, you know, our Formula One cars are hybrids. And we're, you know, we have a great series called Formula V that is producing some really exciting racing out there. So anyways, uh, with today's cars, it's good to know about high voltage systems. Um, and so we have classes to help you guys get set up for that. All right, so electrical circuits, it's all about measuring voltage, current, and resistance, and it really relates to water. Um, and it's, you know, as soon as you can, sign up for like a class like our multimeter class, our 181, or um, our uh, full-blown electrical class, AT330. The better, the, the sooner you understand electrical systems and electrical testing, the, the better you will do in all your automotive classes, because every, you know, system in the car these days is electrically controlled or monitored or, or related in some some fashion, right? It used to be like, oh, I don't want to deal with electrical stuff. I'm just going to work on brakes, right? Well, brakes and stability control systems and analog brakes, that's standard equipment these days. So there's electrical controls on those brake systems, right? So every system of the car has electrical controls and it's up to us to, to know how to deal with that stuff. Okay, the other thing we talked about last week is we got into a little bit of OBD or onboard diagnostics. And we talked about how cars evolved from the 70s to the 80s and into the 90s. We launched this thing called OBD2 in 1996. And the cool thing about that is it standardized a lot of stuff for us and allows us to have the same scan tool interface connector that can hook up to all different kinds of cars. So I can use this little ELM 327 connector. I can use this thing to get some basic scan data off of a Toyota or a Ford or a Chevy or a Mazda or a whatever because of that standardization. And we had a little lab assignment that asked you to do some scan diagnostics. And some of you guys did that. I actually graded some of those that were turned in. Um, pretty cool stuff. It's always more exciting when you have codes in the computer. Some of you guys scan your cars and they were just perfect. So there was no codes. Um, but anyways, at least you got to see a little bit how it works. Now, I am a big proponent because a lot of people think, hey, I'm just going to scan the computer and it will tell me what's wrong. No, nope, that scan tool does not replace knowing how to use your multimeter, knowing how to use a lab scope, knowing how to use other tools. And really, it doesn't replace you you'll get codes from the computer of what the computer thinks is wrong. Oftentimes that's not what's really wrong. And so you have to go through a diagnostic procedure like this to figure out what's wrong with the car. And that scanner becomes one more tool in your diagnostic box of other tools to help you figure out what's wrong with the car, to help you do that diagnostic. So just kind of going through these, Right, if you have the mill on or check engine light on, right, I verify that complaint. Yep, it's on. And now I'm going to start going in there and uh, going through my steps. So my next step is to pull some codes. Here I got my scanner app on. 
I'm pulling this P0135 code for a heated oxygen sensor. Okay, so hold the code. Uh, I also check for pending codes. Those are codes that are have been triggered, but they haven't been fully set as a full-fledged code in the computer. And on this little app, I would go right here to do that. Um, and so I only have this one code, so that's pretty nice. Then I would look at my freeze frame data. That's how I was driving the car when the code was set, which is a nice feature of OBD2. So I can see the temperature of the engine and the speed of it. I can even see the speed of the car when all this went down. Uh, and then you start looking at data. Now, this can be tricky because it takes a while to know what you're looking at with this data. It takes hours and hours, honestly, and some training about how all these different sensors work. Like what should an oxygen sensor look like? That type of thing. Um, and even as a professional mechanic, you're gonna get data that you're not sure about. And so this is where we really need to review service information. One of the things I like to say is that, hey, you, you can't know everything. In fact, the more I learn about cars, the more I realize that, wow, there was a lot of stuff I didn't know about cars. Um, and I've been a master certified technician now for over 20 years. Uh, and I'm still learning different things about cars, you know, every day, whether it's set up on the race cars or now I'm doing a lot of a lot of engine machine work. Um, but even even diagnostics, as I was kind of going back through some of the stuff I used to do. And prepping my scan tool class. You know, I reviewed some stuff and it, you know, there's definitely lots of stuff to learn. How does an oxygen sensor work? How does that, how is that different than an air fuel ratio sensor? Um, there's just, there's just so much to it. And that's, that's what I find kind of fun about this field and this industry is that if you like to learn stuff, I mean, we, we got all kinds of stuff for you to learn. So here I am in step five, I'm reviewing service information. I'm learning how the circuit for the O2 sensor on this vehicle works. It tells me it needs to get up to 600 degrees before it could start working. It tells me the voltage readings it has. It tells me the enable criteria that I need to meet for that monitor to run. So anyways, you can't skip service information anymore. Now I will say that if you work at a dealership and you work on the same cars, over and over and over and over again, you do get to learn those cars inside and out. And in those cases, maybe you get that service information. You looked at it so many times, it's burned into your brain. And you'd have a, you know, if you worked at a Toyota dealership, you'd have a, a Camry that came in with a certain problem and you would know what the fix was already just by the way the car sounded, okay? And that's what you get from experience, especially working on the same things over and over. But for the rest of us, we got to review that service information. And of course, the first time you get a problem, you know, this is how you figure out what's going on. Okay. So I can't stress that enough. We have a class called AT180 that's all about getting you go, going through the service information. Um, you know, I think as a student, if you took that class, you probably would end up being a lot faster at looking up service information uh, when you finish that class than when you started. And I believe you can still get certified by all data in that class and by ShopKey Pro. All right, um, so step six here is you would use your service information and actually do your pinpoint testing. So here I'm using some of my knowledge of electrical circuits and my multimeter to do a resistance test of the O2 sensor heater element. And actually we're finding that that resistance is way too high. And yep, this car truly does need an oxygen sensor to be replaced on, okay? And then uh, when you make repairs, this is really where you make your money. Um, you don't want to re be replacing parts the car doesn't need, but you, your job is to figure out exactly what it needs and replace just those parts, right? Um, and so, you know, you can see here, we're using an O2 sensor socket to remove that sensor. Uh, and I'm sure I recommended last week uh, to, to always use a direct fit oxygen sensor with the actual factory connector. If not, that's my tip tonight. If you're replacing one of these and these do have a lifespan, the old ones would only last like um, around 30,000 miles. 
as they got a little bit better, they last like 60,000 miles. Newer ones might last 90,000 miles, but they do eventually wear out. Like the service information says, these produce a little bit of voltage, okay? So they, they produce between 0.1 and 0.9 volts. So they're like a little tiny double A battery, if you will. And just like this battery is eventually gonna go dead, so is this oxygen sensor. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, at some point in the life of a vehicle, you'll end up changing it. If you do that, don't get one where you gotta splice the wires together, get something with a direct fit connection. It's a very weak voltage signal, not a lot of electrical pressure there. Any bad connection at all, will throw off your readings to the computer, okay? So get it, you don't have to necessarily get one from the dealer, although that's always a safe way to go to make sure you're getting parts that match the original equipment, um, but at least get a good quality sensor that has the factory connections on it. Whenever you've done uh, repairs on a car, no matter what they are, you always wanna verify those repairs, right? This usually includes a test drive. If it was computer related stuff, you're gonna clear for clear the codes. Then you're gonna check for codes and pending codes after your test drive. Um, no matter what it was, right? If it's brake pads, you're gonna you're gonna bed in those new brake pads properly and drive it around and make sure the brake pedal feels nice and firm. The car doesn't pull to the right or the left. If you did suspension work or a wheel alignment, you're gonna make sure the car goes straight down the road. It doesn't pull, uh, all that type of stuff, right? So you always verify the repairs that you did after you've done them. Never just give the car back to your customer without going through that test drive and checking that thing over, okay? But what about other problems besides scanner stuff that are related to diagnostics? Well, guess what? They require other diagnostic testing tools. And that's what I wanna talk a little bit about now. So let's say I have a no start. And we, we've talked a little bit about this. Remember, you want to ask yourself, does it crank? Because a no crank, no start is totally different than a car that cranks over. I turn the key. That's a cranking no start. That's totally different than a no, no crank, no start. If it doesn't crank over, whether it's a click, no crank or a no click, no crank, you know, it's likely something like a battery maybe a starter, maybe a bad connection like at a battery cable or even a defective ignition switch or something. But if it cranks over, now I have an engine drivability thing where it's either related to heat, fuel, or air. Because those are the three things that an engine needs to run, heat, fuel, and air. So um, before we jump down the heat, fuel, and air uh, rabbit trail here. Let's say I have this no crank, no start, right? I turn the key, nothing, okay? Um, look at this guy right here. He's, he's hooked up. He's got his alligator clips on this nice little fluke meter here. He's hooked up to the battery voltage, hooked up to the battery post, I should say, measuring the battery's voltage. And he's measuring 12.29 volts. Now I have a question for you guys. Um, you know, what's the state of charge of that battery? How charged up do you guys think that battery is? We call this the SOC, the state of charge. What do you guys think about that, uh, that battery? He's at 12.29 volts or basically 12.3 volts. Well, I'll give you a little clue a fully charged battery is going to be 12.6 volts so he's only at 12.3 he doesn't seem like he's that low right would you think that's 90 percent 95 percent what do you guys think there anybody you could put put it on the chat well you guys think about it, I am going to switch my screen share real quick. 
So again, looking up service information uh, is super, uh, super critical. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can look stuff up on Google, like I'm going to say auto battery SOC. But it does take some knowledge to know, like, well, is this reliable information or not? <clears throat> All right. And so, um, like, for instance, AGM batteries or absorbed glass mat batteries, they're kind of special. Not all cars have AGM batteries. In fact, more cars don't have AGM batteries right now than do. So this chart wouldn't really apply to us. But this one is pretty good. Okay. So 12.6 is considered to be a fully charged battery. They have 12.65 volts there. We can see that our, uh, our battery that we were testing in that picture at 12.29 volts, man, that battery was pretty dead, wasn't it? This is not a linear scale. You would think, okay, if, if 12 volts is fully charged or 12.6 volts is fully charged, 6.3 volts would be 50% charged. No, that's not the case at all. In fact, when we're sitting here at, you know, 12.25 volts, 12.3 volts, we're looking at a 50, 60% state of charge. So if I go back to our presentation, we could have a car that doesn't crank over and start because it's just got a low battery. And I've had several cars that actually cranked, but they crank slowly. This voltage is low like this before I start cranking. When I start cranking over, it drops like a rock and it drops below 10 volts. And when it does that, the computers on the car turn off. They just, they can't work correctly. And then the car won't start because of that. So obviously test your battery, make sure that the battery voltage is good. I want to make sure that the battery voltage is above 10 and a half volts. So I'm going to put 10.5 volts while I'm cranking over the engine. Okay. And it should really be 12.6 volts or maybe even a little bit more when I first hook up my voltmeter, like you see in the picture here. Now, if the engine does crank over and the voltage is good, it's better than what we see here. Now I'm down the pathway of heat, fuel, and air. Now, in a gasoline engine, we get our heat from two sources. We get it from our spark plugs. So I'm gonna put spark here. And I'm gonna put comp here for compression. Okay, because I don't care if I have the best spark plugs in the world. I got NGK double platinum split fire, whatever's. It doesn't matter if I don't have compression in the engine. It doesn't matter how good my spark plugs are. Okay, guys. Um, so I need a good amount of compression from the engine as it goes on its compression stroke, squeezing the air fuel mixture. And we talked about intake compression power exhaust. And I need a good amount of spark. Uh, from the spark plugs. All right. So now what we have on the screen is a spark tester. And uh, with our spark tester, uh, we basically, we disconnect a spark plug wire and we, we plug it in like we see right here. And when we do that, what we should see is kind of a bright blue spark that zaps from one end of the spark tester to the other. And that tells us that we have a good coil on the car. It's getting a signal to it. Uh, and spark shouldn't be our issue, okay? Now it doesn't necessarily tell us if a spark is happening at the right time in the four stroke cycle, but at least we know we have spark. And so these little spark testers, like I really like this one right here. They are great tools to have. They're not super expensive. You can get them between 10 and $20. And uh, I actually keep a couple of them like I, I keep them in the glove box in my car. So if I ever have a car that's not starting or running weird, I can, I can do a quick spark test on there. So um, anyways, uh, you know, if you don't have spark, hey, the engine's not going to fire up and run. It would just crank and crank and crank. And so that's a great way to test to see if you have spark available there. And you can go at the coil wire and see if you have spark there. 
And then you could go to individual spark plug wires if you have an older vehicle with a distributor to see, uh, you know, is that power coming from the coil going through the distributor and actually getting to your plugs. Okay, so, um, you know, fuel is another major one. And, uh, you know, for, for our vehicles moving on from the 1980s, they're, they're fuel injected. And most of those then have a higher pressure fuel system. So you need a, a special fuel pressure gauge like this one right here to be able to measure that fuel pressure. And that fuel pressure might be 30 PSI. It might be 60 PSI. There's some cars that are up to 90 PSI. And then there's some cars that are even beyond that. Um, and so one thing I do want to point out is this gauge would work on a lot of my good fuel injected cars. Uh, here's the, you know, on GMs that the adapter screws right on there. If I had a Ford, there's my little Ford adapter there. Um, and this thing goes, I don't know, up to like 100 PSI or so. If you happen to have a car that is what they call GDI for like gasoline direct injection. Those cars run fuel pressures up into the thousands. And what would give that away? Well, you might have a little GDI badge on the car, but if you look at the fuel lines and stuff underneath the hood, you'll see a lot of metal fuel lines. And that will be kind of a, a warning to you that, oh, this thing, I need to, I need to look up some service information um, because if I have a GDI car, I can have anywhere from, let's say 500 to 5,000 pounds square inch of fuel pressure there. And that's enough to, you know, cut my finger off if I just crack the line open with this thing running. So anyways, you do have to be careful doing this stuff and know what you're working on and what those specifications are, okay? Um, fuel injected cars are not gonna start without the proper fuel pressure. So if you have a car and it needs 60 PSI behind those injectors and you only have 30 PSI because the fuel pump is failing, it's probably not gonna start. The fuel pressure is too low to get adequate fuel spray out of those injectors when you go to crank over that car, okay? So testing for fuel pressure is an important thing. And so here's another tool that, that you would need to have really that's not just the scan tool. You could have a fuel pump crapped out on the car, the car won't start and have zero codes from that situation. Okay, well, keeping on our theme of a no start, let's say we have the proper fuel pressure. Let's say we have that 68 PSI that we're supposed to have. We're not out of the woods yet because we have to make sure that the computer is sending a signal to these fuel injectors here. Now, how can I do that? With a special set of fancy test lights, we call these Noid lights. And so what happens with these guys is you disconnect the fuel injector, you crank over the car. What you should get is this thing will start flashing lights at you as you crank over the engine. And that tells you that I'm getting a signal to the fuel injectors. If I have no light here, well, that is my sign then that I I'm not getting a signal to the injectors and I got to go down that route route of diagnostics. Maybe it's a defective crankshaft position sensor. Maybe the computer doesn't have power on one of the pins it's supposed to have power on. Uh, I'm pulling out my meter. I'm getting out wiring diagrams. I'm probably in pretty deep for that type of problem. Okay, um, if we had good spark and we had good fuel pressure and the injectors were working, you know, now we might be thinking, well, now what, right? Well, you know what we haven't talked about is we haven't talked about our comp or compression, right? That four stroke cycle is intake, compression, power, and exhaust. We have to go through all the strokes of that cycle and one of the critical ones there is compression. If I don't build up compression, I'm not gonna add adequate heat to my air fuel mixture to get it to burn. So how can I test for compression? Well, an easy way to kind of indirectly test for it would be vacuum testing. Now, remember, before we go on the compression stroke, we first go on an intake stroke. 
And so the idea is that every time a cylinder goes on an intake stroke, the piston moves down and it creates a vacuum on the other side of that piston. And so here's an engine running at idle and you can see it's making, oh, about 18 inches of mercury, inches HG of vacuum. And that's pretty standard. In fact, 18 to about 22 inches of mercury uh, with the engine idling is normally what you'd want to have. Well, you can also do this test cranking over, right? And uh, while you're cranking over, you should make sure the throttle's fully closed. You might need to block off the idle air control valve. Um, but you should get somewhere between three to five inches of vacuum just cranking over the car. If you don't get any vacuum cranking over the car, that again points you in a compression situation. Okay. If you do get a good amount of vacuum cranking over the car, then you probably don't have a compression problem. Okay. Now, how do you know for sure? Uh, you end up doing a compression test. Now, here's an example. We had uh, we had uh, very low. We had just a little bit of cranking vacuum. I think we really had like you know just a little bit over an inch. And we're like, man, it's got a little bit of vacuum. It sounds like as I crank it over that it has compression. It kind of, rawr, rawr, rawr. but this car sat out in front of the customer's house. Rats had built a nice little nest in the air box. It could move the, the air through the engine and it wouldn't fire up because of that. Um, so how do you really know what your compression would be? Would be to use a compression compression tester. Now you can rent these out from O'Reilly's and AutoZone and stuff if you don't want to buy your own. Um, good tool to have though. What you got to do is take out the spark plug and this tester threads into the spark plug hole. Now you got to have a good battery in the car. You got to have a good starter because you want to crank over the car. You want it to crank over quick, quickly. You want it to crank over. You don't want it to be because that's going to throw off your readings. Okay. And when you do that, this gauge should kind of go through different strokes. So stroke one, two, three, four, five, five or six compression strokes. And you look at your final reading. And for most cars these days, it should be between 120 and 180 PSI. Um, so 120, 180 pounds, if you will, of compression, uh, pound square inch of compression on that gauge with 150 being real common. You think, well, where do you get that 150? Well, if I had a compression, uh, a compression ratio of 10 to one in my engine, uh, meaning that it compresses the air fuel mixture into one tenth of its original volume on the compression stroke, atmospheric pressure at sea level is about 15 psi so you multiply those together and i come out with a nominal reading of 150 psi okay you always really want to compare whatever you're getting to specifications but uh, that's kind of a general rule to go off of to kind of get you in the ballpark so um Basic diagnostic testing, especially for a no start. Heat, fuel, and air, we looked at fuel pressure. We looked at testanoid lights. We looked at spark. We looked at compression, okay? But there's just so many different uh, problems you can get with cars. In fact, a lot of problems are sound related. They're noises, right? And so another tech tip I have for you, another great tool to have that's not super expensive is a mechanic stethoscope, okay? looks like this you could generally get them for less than 20 bucks and i really like this one in particular because what it allows me to do is use it in two modes now not all of these allow you to use them uh this way but i i like this style it has a little cap here and i can unscrew this cap and take it off and that gives me two ways i can use this tool Without the metal wand and cap on there, I basically end up with a tool that has a, a cone on the end of it that can direct the sound into my ears. And that works really good for, uh, you know, uh, air sounds, if you will. 
I have a vacuum leak. I have a whistling sound inside the car. Um, that can even help you kind of get to the general area of the sound, okay? Once, if it's a mechanical sound, you can use it in the air mode way to get you in the general vicinity. Is it coming from the top of the engine or from the bottom of the engine or from the left side or the right side? So you can get generally get down to your general zone and then you can put the wand on there and do your pinpoint mechanical testing. So here looks like this technician is maybe listening to bearing noise from the alternator as it's running, okay? And all kinds of problems can be identified by using a stethoscope. So again, another great tool to have. You can diagnose a lot of things. It doesn't break the bank. And uh, this is something we get a lot of complaints about is different noises in the car. My tip for using one of these tools is first, what you got to do is you got to build up some experience. So what I would do is I get a stethoscope and I listen to all the cars I could. I listen to cars that have zero problems with them. Why? Because I want to know what normal sounds like, because it'll sound weird the first time you put the stethoscope on a valve cover and start listening to those rocker arms move and those valves move and the camshafts and the timing chains going through there it'll sound different than, you, than it sounds on the outside. And so you gotta build up some experience as to what normal sounds like, so that when you have something come in that's abnormal, you can start, start to identify what that is. And then as you build up your database, you know, you're like, okay, well, I have a lot of noise right here. You know, I don't know, maybe, maybe, it's, a, maybe it's a stuck valve. Um, you start taking it apart. Your disassembly is really your final diagnosis of what happened, and then you can, you can kind of figure out your disassembly. What did you actually find out what was wrong with the car? And then go back to what did that sound like? And pretty soon you'll be able to do very powerful diagnostics with that stethoscope. So great tool to have, another common diagnostic area. Um, well, with that, that kind of wraps up this presentation. I will say that, hey, diagnosing and fixing cars uh, is a rewarding experience, especially if it's your car, right? That can save you a lot of money. Um, but it's, it's just, it's just fun. Like it always forces you to learn new stuff and to do new things and can, uh, put a smile on your face when, when you do a do good diagnosis, even, even if you're a professional with 30 years of experience, uh, it still can be a real thrill diagnosing a new problem that you've never encountered before. So, um, anyways, hopefully that's given you guys some insight into automotive diagnosis, a little bit of electrical testing, a little bit of scanner diagnostic testing, and some of the other tools that are involved um, in that process, okay? Um, so with that, that kind of wraps, wraps up that presentation. You know, it's it's amazing to say. I'm gonna I'm gonna change my screen share over, and we're gonna go back to the internet here, guys. Um, and really, uh, you know, kind of finish this thing out. So I showed you how we were looking stuff up on Google. Like I'll, I'll Google stuff all the time, but you do have to be careful because you have to know enough to know if the results you're getting are are correct or not, right? If nothing else, if you're Googling something, you know, look look for a consistency. Maybe look at five different sources of information and go with the commonality between those two so you can be confident in, in what you're looking at there. Um, so I'm going to bring it back to our, um, our Zoom screen here, uh, or I mean our Canvas page here on Zoom. And, uh, you know, we put together a, a lot of stuff for you here. Um, you know, I, I put together uh, videos of every single one of our class sessions. So uh, if you ever forget something, you want to go back, I'll keep those up for a while uh, for you guys to, to look at and review. Um, speaking of review, let's let's look at these uh, final assignments that are coming up. So I'm going to open up the calendar and we'll look and see what we have. Now we have a whole bunch of uh, extra credit stuff. And so don't get, you know, don't get too stressed out about that. Like 
this is stuff you know you don't have to you don't have to do that stuff it was extra credit opportunities um i will be taking your guys attendance from tonight and i have a few more ones to put in there so you get your bonus points as far as attending class zoom sessions uh which it's you know been great having you guys here i have had a, a strong group at each and every class which has been awesome um really the the last two assignments are our final exam which is multiple choice um and uh this using scan tool assignment now i will say that if you've done some of these extra credit things you maybe could skip this scan tool assignment or or skip this one from last week or like points or points they're all going to add up uh together the same so we had a little electrical quiz last week um to finish up but the the final stuff we have for this week our final week of class is really that final exam and the using the scan tool assignment um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click that final exam. And we're going to check it out. So we'll clear out those drawings. And so um, what you see is, is I only give you one attempt. It does have 50 questions, but guess what? You guys have seen a lot of these questions before, because what we did is we didn't want to reinvent the wheel here. So we took a lot of the questions that were from your little quizzes that you guys have been doing all semester long. And we put those questions again in this final. So the vast majority of these questions on this final, you've seen these things uh, before, okay? Um, so in some of these, you know, they start out, they're safety related. Like I'm gonna be put in a vehicle uh, with a floor jack. Well, I want the the jack had to, to lift a part of the car that's strong enough to support it, right? So, uh, you know, here's my right answer right here. If you're ever not sure of an answer, you're doing this test, it's not timed, right? So, you know, go in there and, uh, you know, um, go in there and look up every answer that you're not sure about. Use this exam as one last opportunity to learn uh, about auto mechanics this this semester in this class okay look up all these answers you're not sure about now we do have the answers for you they're built into your canvas class they are in there in the presentations and website links and other things that we've uh, we put in the class for you um, but you could always again look these up on Google or Bing or your your favorite search engine and probably if you kind of sift through there, and again, find the commonality, go to multiple server, multiple information sources, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find the right answer for each one of these questions, okay? Now, we got a few technician A and B questions. I always like to tell my classes, how do you attack these? You separate A and B into two true false statements. So technician A says, hey, when I'm putting in a new oil filter, it's not necessary to lubricate the O-ring seal before installation. I gotta ask myself, is that true or is that false? Well, guess what guys, that's a big false. I want to put oil on that new O-ring to lubricate it as I put that filter on, okay? So he's wrong. Technician B says the oil filter should be tightened approximately three quarters of a turn after the oil filter seal makes contact. Yes, I would say tech B is true now i also like to say that it does vary from oil filter to oil filter so some oil filters are three quarters of a turn some are one turn some are seven eighths of a turn so i always say hey read the instructions on the filter but yeah approximately three quarters is a pretty good ballpark so i'm going to say technician b is the right one to go and yeah, boy, I had to I had to read these answers carefully because normally it goes tech A, tech B, you know, but uh, here that the order here was mixed up a little bit. Technician B, he's he's the guy uh, that I want there. So, um, so that's really the the big assignment for you is getting that final done. Again, you guys have done a great job. If you have any extra credit that you want to do, get get that stuff submitted. Let's go back to the top of this um, final and just look at um, 
uh, look at some of the uh, information about it. So you can see that um, even though it's due tomorrow, because that's technically the last day of the semester, it is open through Friday. So um, you have several days to, to get that thing done. Uh, even if you do it a little late, you'd only lose a, a point or two. It's not, it's not a huge deal. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's no time limit on this, on this thing. So like I said, look up all the answers that you can. And then at the end of it, it'll show you what answers you got right and what things you missed. Okay. Um, so that's, that's how that will, will end up. Don't forget, like, if you want to see where your grades at, go to the grades tab. And from there, it'll show you what assignments you've turned in, what assignments you haven't turned in, what assignments maybe you've submitted, but I haven't had a chance to grade it yet. Like I said, after next, uh, next Monday or Tuesday. So that'll put us about, uh, you know, May 22nd, 23rd, something like that. Um, I'll, uh, uh, you know, I'll get, I'll get that stuff submitted and you should see a good final grade on there. If, um, If you're looking at your grade, let's go back to the home screen here. Uh, if you're looking at your grade and uh, you know it's different than what you think or you have questions, or my email address is right here. You can also um, you can also use the uh, you know uh, email options and stuff that are built into Canvas, or email me directly and uh, ask me questions. I'm happy to to go over some stuff. I'm human, you're human, we all make mistakes sometimes. Um, I'm happy to correct that stuff uh, right away. You will not offend me uh, in the slightest. So anyways, um, gosh, guys, I, you know, I, it, it sure hasn't been, you know, as much fun as we normally get to have with a hands-on class, I'll be honest with you. But it, it has been interesting, uh, it, it has been fun. I've learned a lot trying to organize this site and, and, and get this information for you guys uh, in, a, in a, you know, somewhat clear and concise manner. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it and gotten some stuff out of it. Um, with that, does anybody have any questions or anything for me uh, in the class as we wrap things up? All right. Well, I don't hear anybody speaking out and I don't see anything popping up on the chat. So um, again, I'll be looking for those those emails um, and I'll be updating grades throughout the week and weekend and into early next week. Um, and I'll put a final class announcement up. So uh, be sure to you know look at your announcements. Um, I'll make sure that I put a final class announcement up uh, you know, before I'm getting ready to submit grades to the district office so that you guys get one last chance to hop on Canvas, check out what your grade is and make sure everything's, you know, what, you know, how you, how you uh, think it should be uh, before I get those suckers sent in. And then uh, with that, hopefully I'll see you maybe in a summer class or next fall. And we're really working towards getting us to a normal uh, school semester for the automotive program uh, by by next spring. So um, we're really looking forward to that. But we are doing hands-on this summer uh, and we'll be doing more hands-on classes in the fall and kind of easing ourselves back into doing what we do at a high level. So thank you guys for, uh, for being with me. And uh, again, hope to see you in a future class. So take care, everybody. And as I always say, keep learning and uh, keep having fun. Bye.